So software transactional memory is easy. Uh, a colleague of mine remarked that my last talk here was binary search is hard. <laughs> uh, I think I want to say it's easier than you would think. It's probably more accurate, but this is a much better clickbait. So, all right, I guess first, what does AtNexus do? This is our tagline. AtNexus powers the advertising that powers the internet. Uh, concretely, I mean, the goal here is to say, well, it's much better to have good ads and have freely accessible websites than to have a paywall. And we're trying to figure out how to make that work to everyone's benefit here so that it's easier for people to publish their own websites and be able to run them without losing money. And it's also good for people when they're on the internet tr trying to just read what they want to read without you know, getting really annoying ads. And we do that at scale, as Riley said. Uh, our all time query per second is 5 million a second worldwide over five data centers. Uh, the like, lowest point that we currently have is 2 million per second. That's the least amount of traffic that we see. And currently at peak, we're around you know, 4 million requests a second. And of that, about half of those requests are bid requests. So this is someone who goes on a web page that eventually calls into our system that says, this is all the information I have about this web page, that person. And within a very strict amount of time, we have to determine uh, what creative, what ads, what images to show to people, and how much an advertiser or a network is willing to pay to show that ad. So overall, that translates into 120 billion auctions per day, uh, which is a big number to process, especially when you look at the rate that comes in. There's only so many hours in a day. <laughs> and then we come to what do I do here at AppNexus? Uh, I thought I would have figured it out by now. Uh, <laughs> so this is what I decided. What do I work on? That I can tell you. Uh, all right. So this is what happens when an ad hits the AppNexus platform, either through a direct tag that do a ends up doing an HTTP call into our system or through supply side partners that, you know, through various ways, end up getting into at the AppNexus system, we hit what we call the impression bus. What the impression bus does is it routes a bunch of remote procedure calls over HTTP. And so the first step is to say, all right, I have this user ID, this cookie. I want to know everything that I can know about this user. For instance, if I is it a website, it's very likely that at Nexus would get something like, oh, this user is most likely female 16 to 20, just because of the amount of tear swift that I listen to every day at work. All right. Uh, <laughs> so this is get all, all that data, and then Inbus assembles all that and creates a bid request and sends that to a bunch of bidders. So at first, Inbus was pretty much the only thing that we had at AppNexus and realized that writing a bidder is hard. A lot of people want to do it and then realize it's very expensive, it's, main, it's a lot of maintenance, and it's not what they're interested in. What they want to do is to apply their knowledge of what, how advertising works and not just write very fast C. So we also wrote our own bidder, what we call a console bidder. And that is the other component that I work on that basically does bidding on behalf of about 3,000, 4,000 members or companies, and that translates into perhaps 100,000 advertisers. And Inbuzz gets all these bids, runs an auction, determines the winner, and sends that back either directly to the web page or to the SSP who does its own, um, its own auction. And then there's another component, which we call Cookie Monster, that takes care of all the user data. So all in all, I consider that to be the two and a half apps that I work on, Impression Bus, Bitter, and Cookie Monster, because it's such a baby app, so nice. Uh, and this is all distributed with remote procedure calls over HTTP. You could say, well, that's not very efficient, but we made that call because HTTP is just has so much tooling to work around. I think as an engineering choice, as you look at a system that is always slightly broken, HTTP is the right call rather than something bespoke. It's also all multi-threaded, uh, not because we need to do a lot of things in parallel. We typically only process a couple transactions, so it could be a bid request coming in or an ad call coming in at a time but there's just so much configuration data, so much stuff like, uh, say, 
uh, on the cell side, on the impression bus, I could have, um, I don't want to show flash ads because I think that's really annoying on my web page. Or it could be, well, I only want to show ads that are intended for, say, young adults or perhaps children because I'm not sure that I want to have that kind of backlash with adult ads on 17.com. <laughs> And on the buy side, it could be something like, well, all right, I'm running uh, an ad campaign for a car dealer. And currently, I'm targeting, say, males age 20 to 25 who seem to be interested in cars. And now I want to widen that net because I find that there are that many people. So I could be widening to, say, male and female, or say, saying, all right, probably age 20 to 30. And all of these updates are what we call configuration updates. And as you take into account the amount of people that we work on behalf of, about 4,000 companies, that ends up being a lot of data to just keep in RAM because we can't put it on disk. The, mom the moment we hit disk, we're probably going to be too slow and not hit our deadline on the auction. And that brings us to the other very smart, interesting thing about our apps is that it's, it's soft real time. So it's not hard real time. It's not real time, real time. So a real-time system is something where if you ever miss a deadline even once, it's a total system failure. So if you work on a nuclear reactor, on a rocket, on a car, that would be a real, real-time system. It's also not like a web page where, say, well, you have a goal of rendering a web page in under 100 milliseconds, but if you render it in 200 milliseconds, it kind of sucks, but you still render a web page. You still get value out of it. Here, the moment we have one operation that is past its deadline, it's useless. All that work that you did to get, say, a bid response, if you send it back too late, so you had 30 milliseconds to say, oh, wait, I want to show this ad for this much, and you send it 33 milliseconds later, it's useless. No one's going to look at it, so it's just all wasted work. It's better to send a partial response than to send a full response too late. And finally, writes are very infrequent. Like I said, writes are writes to configuration data so that would be something like a, a user, like a person going on a website and going, all right, I want to change the targeting criteria for this campaign and say, I want to show my ads to more people. That doesn't happen that often, and we try to batch them. So we might get an update every five minutes, and in the meantime, we'll have processed millions of bid requests, so we'll have a look at billions of objects. So, if you look at the ratio of writes to reads, it's very skewed towards reads. And yeah. Uh, no, I can skip that. All right. So, oh yeah, right. So, and this is what we're going to talk about here how you handle the reads when you have stringent latency requirements and just deadlines on the read side, and still you have to update your configuration data. It's kind of what we call the batches problem here, because as you see, the three components that I work on all get their updates from this old guy, batches, top right. All right. So it might not be obvious why this is a problem if you haven't had to deal with multi-threaded code before. So uh, let's take this one running example. It's going to be, uh, I'm Paul. I live in New York City. My zip code is 1010. I happen to live in the office. Uh, and I want to move to a nicer place. I want to move to California, zip code 90210. And at the same time, I'm trying to update my contact info. Someone else is trying to read it. And he goes, all right, what is their state? What is their zip code? Right? Ideally, he would get either the old one. So he'd say, all right, Paul's state is New York and lives in zip 1010, or it gets a new one. So state, California, and zip code 90210, but not a mix of the two. Like saying, oh yeah, state New York, zip 90210 doesn't make any sense. Same thing for state California and zip 1010. Like that just is not a thing. And the problem here is that useful operations in computers are not atomic. You can't just write to 10 fields at the same time. You can usually only do one. So we have an ordering between the updates to the state and zip and between the reads to state and zip, but there's no guarantee on how all these two pairs of operations will interleave. So if we're lucky, everything will work out fine. So for instance, we could say, well, first you write to state, then you read state, then you write to zip, and you read zip, 
and that will end up being, well, all right, so Paul lives in California with zip code 90210, but we might be unlucky and say, all right, first I write to state, then I read state and zip, and then I write update zip again. And that would say Paul lives in state California with zip code 10010, which is actually in New York, so that doesn't make sense. And it turns out that as you have a larger number of fields to update, most of these interleavings will give you invalid data. And that's where concurrency control comes in. Concurrency control is how you either detect or make sure that these bad interleaving don't happen. Uh, so, um, and there are two ways to do this. The first one is optimistic, where you kind of do something very stupid and you then check at the very end if you got lucky. So you detect if a bad interleaving happened or you're pessimistic and you make sure that it never happens but that means extra work if there was nothing happening at the same time. This is good also for both reads. So making sure that you don't read something while someone else is writing to it, and for writes, making sure that you don't write to something while something else, another thread, is also writing to it. Um, so I had this analogy of optimistic concurrency control, which is, um, so back in college, I had roommates uh, who live in an apartment and we had only one bathroom to share. And there's always this one guy who's like, well, I don't really care if I lock my bathroom door or not, because most of the time there's no one around, right? The odds of collisions are so low. So they would just close the door, do their thing, and then open the door again. And that way they would save like two seconds locking and unlocking the door. So smart. <laughs> and then from time to time, someone else would go in there, and there would be like pure disaster as you try to recover from this <laughs> collision. Uh, <laughs> so that, that would be optimistic concurrency control, where you pray for the best, and then you do a lot of work when something bad happens. The pessimistic approach is just, well, lock your door, take the extra time. And in the common case, it may be slower, but in the worst case, it will probably be faster. And this is why this is important. Uh, that's a graph of the timeout rate for bidders on our platform in uh, New York that was on a slow day, so Sunday this week. And you can see there's three people who just never managed to respond in time. And then there's everyone else. And they're clustered around, you know, 1 to 15% timeout rates. So these people are bidders, third-party bidders that are plugged into Inbus. We send them a bid request, and about 1 to 10% of the time, they send us a re response, but it's too late. They did all this work, and like, uh, sorry, we ran the auction. It's for nothing. So this is the same thing on a log scale. So you can see the clustering around average of, say, 0.1% seems to be the standard for uh, the AppNexus ecosystem. So most bidders on our ecosystem, 0.1% of bid requests that they receive, they'll try to answer, and then they'll send something back too late and just waste their time. So this is the AppNexus bidder at 0 0.015 timeouts. And so uh, about six times fewer, we could probably get it down to 0.001% timeout rate. But there's a question at some point of what's the benefit you're going to transact on you know, less than 1 in 10,000 more impressions. There's a lot of engineering costs associated with the improvements. Not sure it's worth it. Ah, and at the very end, see the spikes here? That's what happens. We have a background process that comes in, does some cleanup in the middle of the night, and your bidder is scheduled out. That's just live. So, all right, this is the plan for tonight. First, what is software transactional memory? And then I'll present a quick baseline implementation. And then I present what we use here in production, the AppNexus single writer STM, and we'll move on to questions. So what is STM? So first, the S is for software. It's implemented in software. And that's uh, by opposition to the initial proposal, which came out of MIT in the 70s, where they said, well, we should do this in hardware. Right? Just put it on a chip. Uh, this, I don't know, something you would, it was something at MIT in the 70s. They also wanted to do garbage collection in hardware, so. <laughs> All right, it's also transactional. So 
Transactional here would be something like database transactions, where you define the beginning and the end of a transaction, and within the boundaries of a transaction, things must make sense. So what does making sense mean? In databases, that's asset. So atomicity, either a write happens or doesn't happen, but you can't see half of a transaction in your database if it happens to fail. Uh, C is consistency. If you have foreign key rules, for instance, they will always be like okay, and if they're not, the write will just be canceled. In an STM, that doesn't happen. We assume that coders know what they're doing because obviously that's what happens in real life. Uh, the I is for isolation, and that is the key part. Isolation means that if you have two transactions that are executed at the same time, they will see data as if executed one after the other or one before the other. Like there's, you won't see interleaved data say, oh, I'm gonna see half of your rights and then half of the old data. So either I see all the old data or all the new data, but not a like hybrid of the two that doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, in the example, state New York City and zip 90210, that's not cool. And D is durability, that would be uh, if your system crashes, either like hard system, like hardware failure or software failure, then you still have a state that makes sense. We also don't have that in STM usually because we only care about threats. And that's because M stands for memory. Here what we're trying to do is we take threads, multi-threading, which is very hard to work with, shared mutable memory, and turn that into a system that makes sense with transactions. So you can see that's kind of much more abstract than the usual way to do threading, which is I have a mutex and condition variable, and then do your thing, right? Just write to the memory, whatever happens is up to you. Uh, it's good because that gives us more freedom as the implementer of the STM system to find low hanging fruits of our performance and to make sure that things work well and to add guarantee that say we won't deadlock. It's bad because if you don't do all these things, the system will be very slow. Oh yeah, and uh, I said we don't do ACID. There's this one system, it's called Watercan, that actually does ACID for RPC, remote procedure calls. It's interesting. It's also kind of much too slow for our purposes because we would rather, say, not receive a bit request than to reply to it a second later. If you have different trade-offs, that might be an interesting line of work to look into. All right. So again, this is what isolation means. That's like kind of the heart of what we're trying to explore tonight. It means I have updates to a bunch of fields, and I read these fields at the same time, but I won't see any, any inconsistent ordering, like, say, uh, First, you apply the update to the state, then you read state and zip, then you apply the update to zip. It's always all before or all after the writes. And you also have the progress guarantees, because this is key. Like, it's very easy to just slap a lock on everything and say, all right, now everything happens one after the other, but then you just have a system that is correct but slow. So in our field, it's kind of incorrect. Uh, so. At the very bottom of the hierarchy, it's called blocking. Uh, sometimes it's called locking. And it's easy to think, if I don't have any mutex, I don't have any spin lock, then I'm not blocking. But that's not what it means. Here, we're looking for semantic locks. So it's for a way for any thread that says, say, if this thread stops making progress, either it crashes or it's never scheduled in, then the whole system grinds to a halt. If there's any condition that gets there, that's a blocking system. Then we have obstruction free, not that interesting. It's a, if you stop every thread except for this one thread that you want to see progress in, then that thread will eventually finish what it's trying to do. But that never happens in real life, so really whatever. Uh, <laughs> and then there's lock free, which I think is the sweet spot for most of us. That says um, you may have 10 threads, only one of them will eventually finish what it wants to do, and the nine other will have to try again. But that's fine because the whole system did one operation. You will never have everyone live locking and just trying again to do the same thing. But there's still no any not any guarantee of fairness, and that's what read free does. It says every single thread is guaranteed to finish what it's trying to do in a bounded amount of time. That's a very strong guarantee, and usually it ends up being just a lot of overhead for nothing. Right. So if you think about it, that's a very extreme case. I said we're trying to guarantee progress if a thread either crashes or is never scheduled in, just stops executing. 
Like if a thread crashes, usually the whole process crashes as well, so who shares, right? And we don't have stupid schedulers, so usually we can expect on threads to eventually make progress. Um, so why do we care? We care for the same reason that we do worst case analysis for say asymptotic runtime uh, or memory usage. If we can show that in the worst case, things aren't too bad, then we know that in the actual case that we see in the real world will also be okay. And it's much easier to do analysis in the worst case if you try and define what we expect to see in actuality. So that's why we focus on these kind of very academic settings. And then next question is, you know, why would you want to use STM? That's great. You could do an STM, why the hell not use a lock? So, I mean, there are two main reasons. One is logs don't compose. So let's say you have a data structure that is thread safe. You have a hash table, you slap the lock in front of it, and you say, okay, now I can do get and put on the hash table, and it's all safe. What you're trying to do is actually use that hash table to implement a counter. For instance, I'm an advertiser for BMW, and I want to make sure that I don't show my ads more than a million times per day because I'd rather spread it out throughout the months. So I have this counter. So I, what I do is I, I want to increment. I know that I've shown an ad now. So I get the number of impressions for that brand. It's called ant, increment n plus one, and start it back. So that's great if there's only one process that's trying to increment the counter at the same time. What if there are two or four? They would all read and at the same time, and they would all write back n plus one, one after the other. So each interval of operation, each get, each put makes sense, but they don't compose. You try to do something that's more useful, that's at semantic level, and some, somehow you get something that doesn't crash but doesn't do what you want to do. That's why you want to have transaction instead. It's, you say everything that happens within a transaction has to make sense. Also, lock-free code is hard. Um, we do a lot of what we call RCU, that's read, copy, update. It's a technique that is mostly used in kernel programming. And the idea is to say, well, instead of updating an object inline, you create a new copy, you find all the references to that object, you repoint to the update, and now you're OK to free the old object. So the problem is, if you have multiple references, you have to keep a list of all the back references, and that ends up usually not working well, and you have stale pointers, and eventually you just read bad data that has been freed, and you crash. Then there's also that just by taking all of this code, that is usually if you work with logs, you're going to have to spread around and say, all right, I'm going to do my I'm gonna do business code. And in the, in the middle of that, I'm going to add some more code to make sure that you lock everything in the right order. Right? So you have to think about both business and concurrency control, low-level stuff. Um, that's annoying. Most people want to do one or the other, and that makes a lot of sense to me. So usually what happens is they say, well, all right, I'm going to be not too smart, but I know that it will work. And that leaves a lot of parallelism on the table that you could use, but that's a lot of work, again. So here, the idea is to say, all right, I'm going to take all the hard work, centralize in one component, the STM system, and everything else will just win and follow from that. All right. So I think, all right, so how do you build an STM? There are many answers, but there seems to be kind of two axes. The first one is, how do you implement concurrency control? And there are three main ways. One is blocking. You add a lock, you use locking, you're pessimistic. You try to make sure you wait until you're sure that you're OK, and then you do your thing. You can be optimistic, so you start doing your thing, and then at some point, you try to commit, and either you succeed, or you find that something bad happened, and you roll back, or you have multiple versions. And VCC, multi-version concurrency control, so you might, say, have multiple versions of the same object, and either you know that writes don't ever go in conflict, or they do, but readers are OK because you can always read from the version they expect to see. And then you roll back if you don't get what you expect. And the other question is, do you do it at the object level? Right. Do you do STM, uh, like, I have this object give me the object that actually corresponds to in the current transaction? Or do you do it at a byte grant that already kind of closer to the C programming model? More transparent, also much more work. It's not clear which is better. Okay, so in 2010, these five dudes 
I presented transactional mutex lock. And the idea was they were saying, well, there's been a bunch of work on SDMs, but there's no one baseline implementation that is simple, that we know works fairly well, so that we can compare against. So they introduced this thing. It's about 50 lines of code. And it's actually competitive with a lot of the things that had been published until then. So <laughs> good thing, I guess. And the general idea is to say, I'm going to have one sequence lock for everything that is stored on the heap. So sequence lock is kind of versioning, but correct. So this is why versioning doesn't work. You could say naively, I want to just add a version counter to the heap. And whenever I do an update or a set of updates, I'm going to increment that counter. And then as I do my reads, I can just check that the version is still the same that I had at the start of my read transaction. So in my example, I would start with version is 0. I'm in, I live in New York, and my zip is 10010. Then I'm going to apply my update, write state is California now, zip is 90210, and version is 1. That gives us to the end state, which is version 1, state California, and zip 90210. Great. But what happens on the read side? Well. If you're unlucky, you could have something like, OK, you read the version, you read the state, then all the updates happen except for the version bump. And then you read the zip and the version again. But now you don't know that something happened because I haven't bumped the version from 0 to 1 yet. And that's what we have to avoid. That is the hard part of versioning. And the idea of sequence is to say, well, all right, if I can't just have this version number, going to have two things in the same field. I have one, a write bit that says, is there a write in progress? And the second one that says, well, this is the current version. And if the version is odd, a write is in progress. If it's even, no write, you're OK to start and try to read. Ah, yes. So there's a bunch of code snippets in the next couple slides. Uh, they all have uh, CK something something functions. That's because we use concurrency kit here. Uh, the reason we use it is that uh, the whole computing ecosystem is centered on lying to you and doing what you mean and not what you wrote to do it more efficiently. So computers lie to you, compilers lie to you. It also happens for multi-threaded code, your intuition lies to you. Uh, with concurrency kit, you have a bunch of primitive to keep both the compiler and the CPU in check. So they actually do what you wrote and not what they think you meant. And there's a bunch of pre-built primitives. So that you don't have to try and rewrite it by hand and get it wrong. OK. So this is the code uh, for sequence lock STM to do a write. What you do is you load the current counter, you get a value, you add one, and you store that back into the counter. And now you're on x86, and that's all you have to do. If you had multiple writers, you would have to either add a lock, or you could do a compare and swap loop where you say, all right, I have this value. I'm going to try to increment it. And if someone else did it before me, I'm going to try again later. And this is what the read side looks like. So first, you start a read transaction. You say, OK, I'm going to try to find a read counter that is even so that no one is writing to. And at some point, you finish. You return that. And then every time that you're about to use a value that you read from the heap, you call read check. And you say, all right, is the version counter is still the same that I expected that I had at the beginning of the retransaction. If so, I'm good to go. If I'm not, I have to fail, roll back, and try again. But it's good, because you're in retransactions, so rolling back is just a no up. So this is what it looks like, again, on the same example. We started with version 0, we recommended to 1. That says, hey, I'm, I'm starting to write. Don't try and read my stuff. Then we write to our field, so state California, zip 90210. And then we increment again the version counter. Now it's odd, so no write is in progress, but it's also not zero. So we know that something changed since we started reading. So for example, here on the read side, say, all right, I'm going to start by reading the version counter and the state. So you start, OK, version is zero, state is New York, then time passes. And either we find that version is one, so we say, oh, well, the write is in progress. It's changed. I have to try again. Or we find that version is 2. So no write is in progress, but it's still changed. So I have to try again. Great. That's all our problem. So on the right side, there's almost no. <laughs> this is like two instructions plus a write lock. If you have multiple writers, it's just very low overhead, right? And on the read side, 
But also, this is kind of more annoying because after every read from the heap, you have to make sure that the heap is still consistent, that no write has happened. If it has, you have to fail, and then you either throw an exception or you do a long jump. Yay. So, what are the properties and guarantees of this system? Well, first one is reads can happen in parallel. And that is kind of nice, right? And it's obvious because reads don't write to anything, so there's no way they can conflict with anything else. You don't even know that a read is in progress. However, there's only one write at a time, which may be bad if you're trying to have multiple update threads. For us, we don't really care. We only have one update thread. We centralize everything to one updater. Writes will never roll back, so that's good. Once you start your write, you can start doing IO, like say, I don't know, uh, sparking off a rocket and it goes up in the air, you know, have to roll back and try to bring back the rocket down to ground. However, reads can be canceled, which would be bad for us because most of our read transactions are something like, a, I got a bid request, now I have to run an auction for that bid request. If we have to cancel all the work that we did and run the same auction again, we might just not meet our deadline. It's also low overhead, especially on writes, but there's a lot of false conflicts. Because there's only one sequence counter for the whole heap, you don't know if you, know, you were trying to read Riley's location while someone was updating mine, you would still get, oh, well, a write has happened. I don't know where, but you might have bad data. So the usual way to fix this would be to stripe the sequence counters. Um, the bad part about striping is that on the read side, when you start a read transaction, you would have to read every single sequence counter, and if you say you have a 1,000 stripes, not so good. But there are ways around that. So if you want to think about it, it's a nice exercise. All right. So that was the baseline implementation, about 50 lines of code. Not a super good fit for our needs, but still, it's a good hint that STMs aren't that hard and that it might make sense to either use something that we know we can understand or to roll our own if we have very special needs which is the definition of AntNexus. Uh, so here are our requirements. We can't roll back, and we don't want to block, because blocking means timing out. That leaves us only one option, having multiple versions at the same time of the same data. Also, the good thing about us is that we know that we only have one writer and multiple readers, so we also know that we don't care about what happens when writes conflict, because they cannot conflict. There's only ever one writer at a time. Great. So we can do MVCC, but we don't have to handle like conflicting writes. Also, well, we're performance bound. Like, If we're late because we just did too much pointer chasing and our code is now twice as slow, we're not going to meet what we want to do. So we can't add too much indirection, because each pointer that you have to chase through adds a cache miss, and that is not cool. Ah, uh, yes. And I thought I had something interesting. I did. We implemented this more than a year ago. But these guys uh, published something very similar for multiple writers and this year. So if you have a similar problem but want to have multiple writers, you might want to look that up. So the initial idea we had when we started working on SSTM, the single writer STM, is to say, well, you could use an object table. So the object table is a technique used in Smalltalk to implement the become operator. So <laughs> become operator is very weird. It says, I'm currently this object, but in the future, after the become, whenever someone sends a message to that object, I actually send this to this new object. So it's kind of like a replacement. With straight pointers, you'd have to kind of walk the whole heap, find all the references to the old object, and replace them with the new one. And that's not doable, right? That's not practical. So what Smalltalk did is they used an object table. So now instead of having references to objects, what you have is indices into this object table that's just a table of pointers to the real objects. So for instance, to go back into the advertising world, because now I need nested objects, you would have a line item that refers to your creative. So a line item would be something like, uh, I want to make people buy cars, and a creative would be buy this car. Uh, instead of having the line item point directly to the creative and say, all right, I might want to show this ad to someone, it has to say, all right, now I want to show creative 21. Creative 21 points back to the creative that you actually want to show. 
but that's bad because it adds more indirection. But the good part is that, well, it's very easy to do a pointer swap. Now you only have one pointer for every object, so you can update the object table, and you're done. So if you have only one table that gives you a simple way to implement RCU, read copy update. And if you have n tables, n pointers, sorry, then you get NVCC, multi-version accuracy control. And for us, we're going to have two pointers because we only have one right at a time, so we only need two versions. But we can't do indirections. So instead, we do intrusive indirection, and we put the indirections in line next to the actual data most of the time. What this means is, yes, we'll have indirection, but we indirect back to the same cache line most of the time. So we don't pay the cost of the random accesses, and it's almost as if it didn't happen. You also note that we only have one pointer. That's because we need two versions, but the first one is in line with the data. So now we pack two bits of information and that one pointer. One is whether to use a pointer, and second is what the pointer points to if we need to use it. Uh, yeah, the read side. So this is what it looks like. Uh, first it does a null check, then it, it looks at the pointer, and it's like, okay, I got this pointer. Now I have a thread local mask that says if there's an intersection with the bits of that pointer, the low order bits are all zero, so we can pack information in there, and my mask, you have to use that pointer. It's actually uh, an indirection that we want to use. Otherwise, we don't want to use it, so we use the, the data that is in line with the object. And ideally, the last case is the common case. So it kind of looks like this. I have a code. I have this object. I don't know what it is. It's very opaque. And I say, give me the data that's hidden in that object. And I call it to SSTM. SSTM looks at the one SSTM field. It's one word. And it determines if it's null, then always use the inline object. Or otherwise, it's a pointer. Is it a pointer meant for the writer thread or for readers? If it's meant for readers, then you use it, and you point it back to data prime. Otherwise, you don't use it, and you only use the inline data. Right side is very similar, except that writers have a different mask. So that way, we can have a pointer that's only used by writers, but not by readers. And uh, yeah, sometimes you want to write you something, and like, well, there's a null in there. So what do you do? You allocate a copy. You set it, it's bad to say, all right, this is for the writer, and now the writer can read from that copy and write to it transparently. And eventually, you commit. Yeah. All right. So for writers, this means same thing, right? I have this object. I want to write to it. I don't know how to write to it. It's very opaque to me. So I call into SSTM. And I say, give me something I can write to. SSTM looks at the one pointer field, and it says, is it null? If so, then create a copy, store it in that pointer, mark it as OK to use by the writer, but not by the reader, and then return that. Otherwise, return the data that's meant for the writer directly. And during all that time, regardless of what's in there, it's not meant for the reader, so the readers will always use the blue data object and not the red one that has the updates. And eventually, we're done. We commit. So we have a bunch of data structures that can be either write or read optimized. When we're about to commit, that's about to send all that to the reader. So we want to mark the objects as read optimized rather than write optimized. So we prepare everything for reads. Then we set all the copies low bits to two. So that says, yes, use this pointer now if you're a reader. And we signal other readers to set their mask to two, which is, again, you're a reader now. You have to use an ESSTM data if there is one. And we wait. That is the first part that blocks so far. Any reader can block the writer if they're doing their thing. So if they're doing a transaction, an auction that may last up to, say, a couple hundred milliseconds, then the writer has to wait. That's not ideal. But then again, what you're really concerned with here is the latency of reads. We don't want to block reads. It's OK to instead block writes because these, those are infrequent. And what makes us money is doing a the read side transaction. It's running an auction, deciding if we want to bid on something. So that is the key part. That's the part that does not, must not block. Okay. So after set three, we're OK. We know that no one is reading from the inline data. So we can write back from the indirection copy back to the inline object. And finally, we signal other readers 
to read again from the inline object. So that last step is important uh, because that gives us back to the same state that we were initially in. Otherwise, we would run out of pointers. That's one and two. We want to make sure that the common case is that we don't use indirection. We always go back to the inline object because that is much more efficient. And once that's done, we can free all the data that we created to have multiple versions at the same time. So this is what happens on a commit. First, we make everyone read from the red part data prime. Now, no, no one is looking at the inline blue part, so we can update it to also be data prime. Once that's done, we can clear the link from the blob blue to the red data prime, and everyone will just transparently read from the inline object, and we're done. So the common case here is that no write is in progress. And yet, at what SSTM does is on the read side, you always check if you might have something to read, if there's an indirection because someone has written to the object. That kind of sucks. Um, but we have a solution to this. We call it an hook, and it lets us toggle code at runtime with what else? Self-modifying code. Ah, right. So this is what it looks like. We call an hook, and then there's namespace and a name and then a bunch of code that you usually don't want to execute, but sometimes you want to jump in there. And that's uh, the implementation. A lot of thing there. Uh, mostly what happens if is it's an if zero, a label, and then inline assembly that says, I might jump to that label in the inline assembly. And the key part here is that we emit exactly one instruction in the mainline code. And it's either a jump that the one upcode jumped to the label I want to jump to, or we can knock it out, transform it into a test. And a test instruction is you do a bitwise end of a register and a literal. You throw out the result. You don't write it anywhere, and you only update the condition flag. So that is almost a no up. And that's great, right? Because you transform a jump into almost a no up, and you can toggle between either one of those with a single byte write. So I realize that not everyone is familiar with x86 machine code. <laughs> so I had this small snippet here. At the top, you see a jump to, what is this, 40 bytes farther. And underneath, you have a test. And you see that these two instructions only differ in the first byte. So the only thing we have to change to go from jump forward to a test that is almost a no-up is overwrite E9 with A9, and then we can go back again by overwriting A9 with E9. And that's the key to our to A and hook for SSTM, because it means that we can hookify all the slow part that says, oh, do I want to do I want to use the inline object, or do I have a mask that says I should use the indirection? No. Now we all put that behind a knocked out jump, and instead we do two things. One is, is this null? If so, return null. Otherwise, return exactly the uh, inline data. And in the common case, the inline data is exactly the same address, so it boils down to one instruction. And this is what we have in prod. So we have first a test, that's our NOP. Then we zero out R8, says, all right, this is our null. Then we check if racks or pointer is null. If so, we move. If it's not null, then we move RDX, that's the data, into R8. Otherwise, we use null directly. And then Way up there at the bottom, you have the slow path that we jump to that usually we never see because it's not even a jump. This is a test. So that's kind of the key part of why we design SSTM that way. And there's like very de nice details of the protocol is that the fast path on the read can be pretty much like these for instructions. So what are the guarantees here? We have parallel reads still, very good. We have serial writes, but again, we don't care because we only ever have one write at a time. The very key part here is that neither writes nor reads can be canceled. You don't, never have to roll back. So we never have to say, all right, I'm starting to read transaction, process this auction, and then as we're almost done, we forgot that the write is happening. We can always complete that retransaction and then read new data. There's very low overhead on reads, especially when you know, nothing is happening, there's no write. Like I showed, there was four instructions. That was great. More, more overhead on writes, but yeah. I don't really care about the performance of writes as long as they happen within a reasonable time, about you know, a couple of seconds, not a couple of minutes. 
and there's no false conflict because there is no conflict. You can never have to roll back everything, always completes. So, so far what I've shown is it is technically, technically feasible to write your own single writer STM. Uh, the hard part was to make it safe and easy to use. It is still kind of a problem uh, in dev as people ask us questions like, this is weird, like you haven't used anything like STM before, how should I write my code? But as I replaced a bunch of lockful code with SSDM a year ago, I also noticed that their old code had a bunch of bugs. So I would rather have questions than silently wrong code. It's been out in production so far for more than a year on three apps, about 700,000 lines of code, and it's running on a couple thousand machines. And we had very few problems so far. There was one scaling problem when we had this huge write transaction and we just go out of memory because of MVCC, but that was it. So <laughs> everyone asks me this when I talk about SSTM is, should I do this in my own organization? Ah, yeah, hopefully you don't have to is my answer, right? There are so many other ways to deal with this problem. You can say, uh, well, eventual consistency is okay. I think that is the case in a lot of times where it's okay if you might get inconsistent data while updates are happening, but once you're done with the updates, reads make sense. So you might have you know, a couple blips, a couple hundred times a day, you might have a weird thing in your logs, but most of the time it's perfectly fine and you don't have to worry about audit complexity. The only problem here for us is that we have a lot of pointers data, so it's hard to do eventual consistency when you have to kind of chase pointers and you might end up reading an old pointer that has been freed. This is my favorite solution to the update problem you say, all right, I'm going to make everything immutable while I process requests. And then I use process isolation or box. Like one machine at a time, I can bring them down, they stop taking on requests, but it's okay because I have a thousand other. They then apply their updates and they go back up on purely immutable data. That I think is the way to go if you can make it work because it's so simple and easy to understand. But I mean, you work with a system that you have and ours was you're always on, you never go down. You always, you always have like 10 worker threads and you have this one update thread that goes on from time to time. Or you could use a perfect. I thought about it. Like what if we use standard stuff and say, all right, it's okay to use double indirection. And then I run some benchmark. It didn't work for us. I think in many other contexts, it would make sense to say, I'm gonna use Haskell or Clojure or one of the standard Scala or Java STMs and use that instead of trying to roll your own. I think that is the best way to go as well if you can't just go for the immutable route. Don't try to roll your own if you don't have to, right? And finally, perhaps you could just re-architect your problem. And say, all right, I have a very write-heavy workload. STM, just any STM is probably just not gonna work for you. You might wanna change the way you think about it and do it like in the Apache, that is Spark or like Kafka way. And say, instead of updating this in-memory snapshot of the state, I'm just gonna have bunch of log of updates and process individual updates instead of looking at current states. So uh, you can do it, it makes sense. Sometimes, I think most of the time, you should find a different solution that is much easier to work with. <laughs>